Thank you. My name is Trey Grayson, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I want to welcome all of you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. We're pleased that the majority leader of the United States of America, Eric Cantor, is here to join us uh, this evening. I want to recognize his wife, Diana, here in the front row. She's got a great seat. Glad to have you here. Before I introduce Leader Cantor, I want to go over a couple of ground rules that we always have here in the JFK Jr. Forum. Freedom of speech and civility are bedrock principles here at the Institute of Politics and the Forum. And they're also bedrock principles for our democracy. In fact, in his inaugural address, President Kennedy reminded us that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. As an undergraduate, I loved coming to the Forum because it's one of the few places in America where you can see and listen to worldwide and national leaders, and when they're finished, they have to participate in an unfettered question and answer session with members of the audience, a practice that invariably results in lively discussion. The reason why this is successful is that our audience respects our speaker's right to free speech, as well as our audience's right to listen to the speech. And in turn, our speakers respect our audience members right to ask unfiltered, sometimes tough, but always fair questions. By following these rules, tonight's event will be added to the long list of successful events here in the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Now tonight's event would not be possible without the efforts of Steve Johnston, uh, who graduated from the college in 2009. Steve currently serves as Deputy Director of New Media for Leader Cantor. In his time at Harvard, he was active here at the IOP served on the Forum Committee, the Fellows Committee, even got an IOP stipend to work on the 2008 presidential campaign of John McCain. And we're proud that one of our own is now pursuing a career in public service. Thank you, Steve, we really do appreciate it. In addition, for those watching at home and on the internet, I wanna encourage you to tune into hpronline.org, that's the Harvard Political Review Online, hpronline.org. They're gonna live blog and have an online discussion of tonight's speech, both during the speech and afterwards. And the HPR is a publication of Harvard undergraduates affiliated with the IOP that's completely independent. We're excited that this, uh, they're participating in tonight's endeavor. So now to introduce Leader Cantor, is Harvard Kennedy School student and co-chair of the Kennedy School Republican Caucus, Matt Shiraki. Matt. Good evening. Tonight, it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker, House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. As Majority Leader, Mr. Cantor is the second highest ranking member of the US House and the highest ranking Jewish elected official in American history. In his 10 years in Congress, Majority Leader Cantor has worked tirelessly to promote a favorable climate for job creation, small businesses, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Young Republicans like me here at Harvard and across the country Look up to Majority Leader Cantor because he's a leader with strong principles and values, but even more than that, he also offers a practical, idea-driven, results-based approach to solving our country's most complex problems. Please join me in welcoming House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. Matt, thank you very much. Uh, thank all of you for coming. I'm delighted to be here. And Dean, I want to thank you especially for providing the live music outside for a welcome. So. The Harvard Kennedy School has a rich tradition and history of thoughtful discourse and debate. And you know, I can't think of a better place to come uh, to debate and discuss the future of our country. President Kennedy once said, let's not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer. Let's look for the right answer. Let us not seek to fix blame for the past, and let us accept our own responsibility for the future. I agree with President Kennedy. I'm not here to dwell on the past, but to engage in a discussion about our future and what I believe we must do to succeed over the next decade. Americans have a rich history of taking on challenges and propelling ourselves forward. Whether it was the American Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, or the Internet Revolution, 
We are unique in our ability to apply creativity, intellect, and leadership to solve any problem. We haven't always done everything perfectly for sure, and we've definitely stumbled along the way. But in the end, we held on to our convictions, and that led to great progress over the years. Now we face new, pro new problems, new obstacles, as this country finds itself at a crossroads. Before us is a choice. It is a definitional choice about who we want to be as a country. And believe me, there is a choice. Let me set the stage by describing two distinct images from last year, one in Europe and one in, Amer in America. Not long ago, in the streets of both Greece and France, we saw young people take to the streets to join in protest against their government's decision to rein in retirement benefits. These were young people who, have, who had barely started their careers worried about retirement benefits. Translation, very early in their lives, these individuals were proven that they were conditioned to rely and depend and look to the government for their livelihood for their future. Meanwhile, at the same time, or shortly thereafter, we saw people in our own country go to the town squares, attend community meetings in halls across this country to demand an end to the explosive growth of government. Their desire? For our government to do less, not more. The contrast to me was astonishing and the message was clear. On one side of the Atlantic, people expected a government-funded future, while on the other, they wanted it stopped. This is an important contrast because it isn't just political philosophy or ideology, but real-life examples of the choice that our nation must make right now. This image tells the tale of two divergent paths. The only question is, which one will we choose? If we assume for a moment that we do not prefer, prefer the story playing out in Europe, then we must ask, what must we do to preserve the things that make America unique? I received a note last year uh, from a graduate of the University of Michigan. Uh, he is now actually attending an MBO program at, a, at another school. But at the time, he was working in England. He was amazed how differently entrepreneurs are regarded in Europe. The friends he made said they couldn't even imagine an entrepreneurial hotbed like Silicon Valley ever occurring or being in a part of Europe. And he wrote, starting a business, even if you fail in the process, is a badge of honor in the US. But in Europe, entrepreneurship is frowned upon. And consequently, the best and the brightest are afraid to take a risk. Even though they are very smart and educated, he wrote, when I asked them about their career path, no one ever mentioned starting a business. They don't think any big new products or businesses will come from the UK in the next 50 years. More recently, I had the opportunity to meet with Chinese President Hu Jintao and a delegation of Chinese leaders who had come to Washington. Their focus on Chinese growth and world preeminence was obvious, but what struck me was their interest in the things that make us uniquely American. It was clear to me that these Chinese leaders don't come to America to ask us advice about our government agencies or our bureaucracies or administrative offices. No, they ask about our centers of technologies. They ask about our research universities like Harvard. They are curious about the innovation economy that's exploded here in New England. They want to know how we do it. They want to know what our secret is. They ask what many people ask. Why do the world's most innovative companies come from America? Whether it's Google or it's Facebook, Apple, Biogen, IDEC, all of them come from America. To me, the answers start right here 
at world-renowned institutions like Harvard, where you're offered as students and faculty the freedom and encouragement to harness your creative energies, to test ideas, to think critically and solve problems. At a place like this, there are no limits. There are no limits to applying your own intellectual capital to achieve remarkable things. I was given a copy of the Harvard Gazette today, and, and the Gazette's topic on the front page is Game Changers. It is about taking the innovation that occurs here in the halls of these buildings, translating them to commercial application so we can change the world. America, because of what goes on here at Harvard, is the crucible of innovation. We do invent things that change the world. And we've always been that land of unparalleled achievement. Our people start businesses. We come up with ideas. And we pr pursue these ideas even though we may know we'd fail. This is who we are as a people. Ours is a culture unquestionably built on opportunity. We are a people desirous of assuming responsibility and earning success. My worry is now that Washington has forgotten that this is the strength of our people, the backbone of our culture, and the engine that drives prosperity nationwide. My concern is we are becoming a country more concerned about government-sponsored financial security than individual-driven opportunity. That, to me, threatens the American ideal of ensuring that the next generation can live better than the last. So again, ask ourselves, what must we do to preserve our future and to give the next generation the best possible platform for success? I believe the answer lies in the success of our private sector. And we better start focusing on, on it now and asking how we can create an environment to restart that engine. I meet with business leaders all the time, and every day they'll tell me, when you get serious in Washington about putting your fiscal house in order, we'll feel better about our future. And with certainty that that will breed, we'll feel more confident about investing and creating jobs here at home. And oh, by the way, please get your spending under control. If our balance sheets look like yours, we'd be finished. Above all, they say, we can out-innovate, we can compete, we can lead any country in the world if we're just given a fair shot. And somehow, we don't think Washington seems to get it. I tell these men and women that we are ready to listen, and we're committed to changing the culture in that town in order to create an environment where, yes, American business can compete and grow, lifting this economy, lifting our country and our people out from under the veil of uncertainty that's clouding our future. There is a central starting point to all of this, though, and that is government must stop spending money it doesn't have. If not, we will erode the necessary foundation for both short-term and long-term economic growth. Washington's currently borrowing nearly 40 cents of every dollar it spends. At these levels, as well as uh, the levels required uh, to finance the forecast debt, the government will crowd out private capital. Less capital available for the private sector means innovation, growth, and investment will slow. The value of our currency will erode. Inflation will accelerate and eventually consumer spending power will recede. This ultimately will lead to a lower standard of living for all of us here in America. This reality, as you know, has touched off a robust debate in Washington about how to reduce government spending and borrowing. We do know that we must act. So the new House majority started by pledging to return discretionary spending levels to those of 2008. We've cut, our, excuse me, we've cut our own congressional budgets and renewed our moratorium on earmarks. And we've said that all spending increases must be offset by spending cuts elsewhere in the budget. 
We've also called on the president to lead us in a discussion about entitlement reform because we know that any serious discussion about spending must include these items as well. Now, reducing spending is a necessary element of long-term growth, but there is more that we must do to reduce unemployment and improve the global competitiveness of American business. And that's why we are initiating a comprehensive assessment of federal policies and regulations, aiming to remove those that are redundant and frankly harmful to the private sector's investment and job creation. Included will be a discussion about a better way to accomplish health care reform with an eye on solutions that, focused, that focus first on cost containment and reduction. We will explore ways to reform our tax code, to broaden the base and reduce rates. We're going to work to jumpstart more free and fair trade so that our exports, exporters can benefit. And we're looking for ways always to make it easier for intellectual capital and innovation to flourish. In the end, I think it's fair to say that we recognize that long-term growth and a return uh, to uh, levels of employment that are more acceptable will only happen when there are more for hire signs in places like Boston, Seattle, and Chicago than there are in Washington, D.C. The renewed promise of growth in America requires breathing life back into our country's culture of individual entrepreneurialism and enterprise and unencumbered opportunity. This requires something else, though. It requires a renewed faith in the institutions, both public and private, of our country. Americans, to me, have always been about the belief that if you work hard, you play by the rules, you get ahead. We operate on the assumption that no matter where you come from, no matter who you are, you should have a fair shot to succeed. Unlike anywhere else in the world, here in America, it is so much more less about where you come from than where you're going. And recently, this American ideal has been shaken. Wall Street abuses have emptied many people's 401ks. Mortgage fraud has devalued our homes. Public employee pensions and benefits have suddenly outpaced those in the private sector. And crony capitalism in Washington seems to have rewarded those closest to the halls of power, leaving many Americans wondering what happened to their fair shot in life. When I think about the kind of America I want my kids to inherit, I'm reminded of how my family came to this country in the first place. It was the allure of optimism. It was the allure of a better life. In my own case, my grandparents came from Eastern Europe, and they were lucky enough to come to this country at the turn of the last century. They fled religious persecution under the czars of Russia, and they were looking for a way and a way of life that they could be who they were. And like so many others that lived in that era in those countries of Eastern Europe, it didn't matter to my grandmother how smart she was, or, or how hard she worked, because there was only so far she could go in that place. There was only but so much she can do. There were limits. And that's what makes America so different. There are not supposed to be, and there are no limits here for us. We are about equal opportunity. My grandmother came here. She ultimately made her way to Richmond, Virginia, my hometown. She and her husband opened a grocery store, and they began to raise a family on the second floor apartment above that store. She became a widow at a, <coughs> at a young age, so she was a single mom. And she raised her two sons, eventually lifting <coughs> her and her sons in the middle class. Only in America. Really, think about it. She didn't go to the right schools. She didn't go to Harvard. And she didn't know the right people. But she worked hard, and she was given the chance that she looked for. And I know 
that if she were alive today, she'd be bowled over by the fact that her grandson is not only a member of Congress, but is the majority leader of the U.S. House. Now, so, so in America, whether you're talking to the union worker in Philadelphia, the retired state employee in Sacramento, or the working mom in Miami, all of them come from different places and different backgrounds. But each of them rely upon a simple and implicit guarantee that the deck won't be stacked against them in America, that they'll have a fair shot. Our goal of all generations, our goal must be to preserve that dream. So we have a choice to make. We really do about the future of this country. In order to protect our way of life, the choice we must make is about changing course and renewing our commitment to reform and to focus on growing the things that make America unique. Innovation, creative thinking, entrepreneurship, problem solving, individual liberty, and economic freedom. For the last 234 years, Americans have made the right choice ultimately, and the results have spoken for themselves. And to paraphrase Winston Churchill, you can always count on the American people to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> and that's about where we find ourselves today. I am confident about the future of our people and our country if we can all bring ourselves to work together, to engage in civil discourse, as you allow here at the Kennedy School, and we can provide that better future that each and every one of us want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leader Cantor. Uh, we've got uh, some time for some question and answers. There are four microphones throughout the audience. You can actually tell because there's already a line at all four spots. Uh, we like, uh, we, we have, of course, some rules. It is Harvard, we have rules. So the rules are for answering a question. First, identify your name, uh, identify yourself, tell us your name and your affiliation with, uh, with Harvard if you have one, which you should because it was an ID only event. <laughs> <laughs> Although I suspect there may be some without the ID. Uh, second is, remember, it's a question. It's okay to have some comments and to set up the question, but keep that brief. We have a lot of people who want to ask questions. The third thing is a question ends and a question Mark, uh, it ends with a question. Uh, so if we do all that, we can get through a lot of folks. I also want to make this announcement. When the leader's finished, when we're done with Q&A, we have another forum tonight. We encourage you to stay. Uh, but he's got to leave, so when we're finished, if you could stay in your seats, uh, let the leader uh, and, his, and his wife and his staff uh, exit, the, exit behind the curtain. And then those who are not going to stay, if you can go ahead and exit. But we really want to encourage you. Uh, Gen uh, former Secretary of Defense Perry is speaking at 730. It's going to be a great forum. So we got a doubleheader tonight. Uh, we'll go over here for the first question. Okay. Hi, my name is Maithili. I'm a sophomore at Harvard College. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. Would everyone who's here with me today please stand up? In 2003, when the Republicans launched the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, they understood that fighting global AIDS was critical to our national security. It was also the right thing to do. But last week, House Republicans cut $1.5 billion from life-saving American global health programs, a reduction that the American Foundation for AIDS Research says will amount to a death sentence for over a million people. Mr. Cantor, this is not who we are. We can't lose our souls and a million lives just to save the average American taxpayer less than two pennies a day. Congressman Cantor, here's my question. Will you save a million lives by going to the conference committee when it meets and calling for a full restoration of funding for U.S. global health programs? Uh, let, me, let me try and address your question and say this. Um, I think all of us understand the need for uh, uh, the global effort to combat the spread of, uh, of AIDS. None of us want to see AIDS spread. We all want to see it eradicated. Uh, and what we've got now is a choice to make, again, as I said earlier. You know, and th this is about trade-offs. It's about the fact that you know, we don't have the money. We just don't. I mean, we are borrowing 40 cents of every dollar uh, that we've got. 
And so as compassionate, I think, as we all are for your cause, um, we'll all have to figure out, everybody, about how to do a little bit more with a little bit less. Uh, and it goes back to the fact that if we want to maintain the ability to lead the world with these type of initiatives, we've got to have the prosperity and the wealth to do it. So right, is that now, it? right now, we've got too many people out of work. And so we've got to worry about how we get them back to work so we can continue to lead in these kind of efforts. So is that a no to my... Is that a no to my... No to my question. Let's go to the next question. I think he answered your question. I think he answered. You know the answer to the question. Let's go up here to the next questioner. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Please give. Your chanting is heard, and we appreciate your interest in this issue, but we want to have a lot of people have the chance to ask questions, and you'll be escorted out by the uh, back door, and we appreciate your attendance and your sharing our views. And now we're going to head up to... Uh, so go ahead and ask your question. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming uh, tonight, uh, Congressman Cantor. My name is Ray Martin. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, first off, thank you to you and Congressman Pence for uh, defunding Planned Parenthood. I think it was great that uh, you did that. Um, my question is, uh, with the President's recent decision to not defend DOMA, uh, what can we expect to be the response from the Republican caucus in the House? Thanks for the question. I also want to say to the last uh, group that was here, you know, listen, this is what this is about. It's about people feeling very strongly on the side of particular issues. And we understand that uh, you know, reducing spending is going to cause a lot of folks to come out and advocate for their cause, and it's fine. Uh, and so uh, uh, I, I appreciate that, Trey, and uh, look forward to even more. So let me, um, let me introduce you. Let me, let me try, and, try and speak to uh, the issue of DOMA and the latest uh, revelation by the president. Um, I was a little taken aback by the president uh, because to me, at least, um, I've never uh, been around when a president decided uh, not to defend a law on the books. Uh, and to me, it is contrary to the sense that we are a nation of laws. Uh, there is a process by which this country uh, uh, reviews its laws, uh, that we have a judiciary that um, weighs uh, congressional action and legislation against the Constitution. Uh, so I'm, I was taken aback, and where we are now, as far as what we can expect, I think, is unknown. Uh, this, again, is there are some options available to us legislatively uh, that we're looking at, again, to try and address this, uh, what is, in my own case, a case of, of first impression. Uh, the gentleman in the Celtic shirt upstairs. All right. Uh, thank you, Majority Leader Cantor. My name is Josh Zagorski. I'm a Harvard College senior. I want to emphasize this question is not about funding and it is not about Obamacare. The question is, do you think that the practice in American companies of bundling health insurance with employee compensation makes the health insurance industry less competitive? I.e., would it be better if companies just gave people cash and said, go out and buy insurance on your own? Uh, let me uh, answer emphatically to the, uh, to the first question. Yes, I think it makes the health insurance uh, business less competitive. I think it takes us away from what I believe would be much better from a cost and, frankly, option standpoint, which is consumer-based health care. Uh, because whether it is the government that is choosing your health care or your employer, uh, both result in the fact that patients uh, are somehow given a back seat. Uh, and we've been able to exist in this country where most people outside of the government programs do receive health coverage through their employer. 70%, I think, is what the number is. Uh, and so, and if you look, most people like their health care that they get from their employer. Uh, but I'll say to you, the reason why we started the whole health care debate to begin with was because this situation is economically unsustainable. Employers who provide that health care coverage are coming in 
insisting they're not going to be able to continue to do so because they can't afford it. Again, which is what spawned the debate uh, last year to begin with or two years ago to begin with. Uh, so I would agree with, your, uh, with the suggestion of your question. Uh, we have to make our health care system more affordable. Uh, and if we engage patients, if we allow employers to provide them with cash, if you will, whether it's through funding a health savings account or it, whether it is changes in a tax code to allow individuals the same benefit that employers currently get as far as tax situation and, and paying health care benefits, we'd be a lot better off. Thank you. Good evening, um, Majority Leader Cantor. Thank you so much for coming to Harvard. It's great to have fellow Republicans come here and teach us young Republicans. Uh -huh. My name is Ari Cole, and I'm an alum of the Kennedy School Class of 2008. Thank you for your service also. My question has to do, when I'm reading online about you, you have a very colorful past from Virginia and <laughs> Richmond, which is a great town I lived in years ago. Can you tell us why you oppose excavation of the Temple Mount, and how did William and Mary make you the politician you are today? <laughs> wow, you've been doing some research. Uh, uh, the first, <coughs> excuse me, the first question is about um, a bill that I put in as a freshman, um, which was to deny aid to the Palestinian Authority until they ceased excavating underneath the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Um, and if any of you have been there, uh, you've seen sort of uh, the situation ongoing at the Temple Mount, the excavations that are occurring in and around it as well as underneath of it. Uh, at the time, there was, uh, it was well reported and documented that the Palestinian Authority um, was excavating without the approval of the Israeli antiquity authorities. Uh, and my sense was that the attempt by the Palestinian Authority was to erase any connection um, of Judeo-Christian uh, uh, history to the land of Israel. Uh, and as you know, if you've studied um, you know, the, the ongoing debate, if you will, in the Middle East, uh, it is about um, the justification or lack thereof in the eyes of the Palestinians of, of Israel's existence. I mean, they will not accept uh, there to be a Jewish state in, in the uh, Middle East. Uh, and I felt it was directly uh, bearing on that point, that if we're ever going to reach a point at which there's going to be peace, there has to be mutual recognition of rights to exist. And I felt that action was uh, in direct conflict uh, with that notion. Uh, as far as William and Mary, um, I actually just spoke at Charter Day at the College of William and Mary, and I attended law school there. Uh, and uh, that was a day in which it commemorated the anniversary of the granting of the charter by King William and Queen Mary uh, of that college. Uh, but I would probably answer that question as I did there. Um, it was about um, the ability for me to um, learn how to hone my critical, an uh, critical analysis and the ability to think critically that I think took me uh, uh, years to try and uh, learn, and I'm still learning, uh, but uh, I do think I credit William and Mary for that, uh, that training. Hi, um, hey. I'm Liesl Newton. I'm a senior at the college. Um, and this fall, after I graduate, I'm going to start teaching social studies in the Mississippi Delta. Um, through Teach for America, a program which relies on AmeriCorps funding. So I am speaking tonight on behalf of the other AmeriCorps affiliates in this room, the folks outside, and the 100,000 signers of our online petition. Um, <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Um, so last week, the House voted on a budget that would eliminate all federal funding for programs like Teach for America and City Year and Habitat, which we believe spur social entrepreneurship. Um, programs funded through the Corporation for National and Community Service not only employ hundreds of thousands of Americans, they also provide people like me who want to serve our country with opportunities to do so effectively, supporting education and healthcare and the environment and communities across America. So our question to you is, why do you propose eliminating funding for programs that invest not only in local communities, but also in the future leaders who care so much about them? Um, 
Cecil, first of all, thanks for being here, and thanks for bringing uh, you know your your fellow students uh, to this forum. That, again, that's what this is about. And and I did. I got this. Uh, I got the signed petition, yeah, and, and and you send it to me of, of people who uh, were in my district. Uh, and again, this is what our country affords us. Nowhere else can you do this. So thank you for being here. Um, I, I just tell you, it, it goes back to the same uh, answer I think I had to those uh, advocating for HIV AIDS uh, program uh, funding as well. We're going to have to make some choices. It's trade-offs. It really is. And, and uh, you know, there are plenty of federal programs um, whose mission is laudable, in and of themselves. I mean, you know, AmeriCorps' mission is to help people. Americans are compassionate people. We're, there is no more compassionate people in the world than America. You look at the levels of philanthropic giving of individuals in the world. No one comes close to us. Again, we're not going to be able to continue along that line unless we rethink uh, the balance between our government and the private sector. Because we've got to get back to this notion that what's unique about us is the engine of creativity and entrepreneurialism the private sector has led this country with. Let it restart. And at the same time, commit ourselves to reform in terms of government funding. You know, we're going to have to think outside the box here. You know, I said uh, in my remarks, we're doing a wholesale assessment of federal policies and regulation. You know, and we, we, we have to hold ourselves accountable. And that's what it comes back to. Uh, so I would say, you know, the, the attempt to try and, and proffer a solution on the way forward fiscally uh, is absolutely painful. Uh, but again, I think if we can all come together uh, and, and try and reason, we'll get to the right result. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Cantor. Thank you for the story about your grandmother. Uh, my name is Mimi Vu, and I'm a Master of Public Policy student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, I come from Lawrence, Massachusetts, about 20 miles north of here. If you drive through Lawrence, you'll see abandoned textile mill after abandoned textile mill. And my question is, assuming that we all make the sacrifices that you're asking for so that businesses can grow, how are you going to make sure that they don't ship these jobs overseas where the labor is cheaper to China or India or Mexico? How are you going to make sure that they create jobs right here at home? Mimi, thanks for the question. Um, first of all, you know, the, the purpose here <laughs> is not just for business to grow for business sake. What do businesses do? They create value and they create jobs for Americans and, and for whatever their shareholders may be or whoever works for them. Okay, and that, that's the goal here. We want to bring down unemployment right now in Washington. We want to work to create that environment. So when you want to say, how do we stop them from shipping jobs overseas? Um, again, let's first of all remember that companies that perhaps expand overseas um, don't do so in a vacuum. It's not as if, if, if they're profitable, it's not as if they aren't growing jobs here at home. Um, there are plenty of studies out there have indicated that if companies do find um, a, a way to operate and, and manufacture, let's say, a good overseas in a much less costly way than it is here at home, and they're still an American company, and the capital comes back here, that tends to nurture the benefit of its shareholders, owners, and the people that work there. Uh, so again, I, I would just caution you to say, you know, we, we're living in a global world right now, uh, and we've got to compete we can't just erect barriers and say, company, if you're based in Boston, Massachusetts, you can't. You can't go operate overseas. I don't care if it saves your shareholders money or it's more efficient or not. You can't. So operate here. That's a false sense of security. We can't operate like that. Uh, and, and I would say <coughs> beyond that, where's the future of American manufacturing? Okay, because you're right. It's not just uh, here in Massachusetts. It's throughout the country. Uh, that our manufacturing sector has seen better days. Uh, but I believe, again, going back to the Gazette today, it is about advanced manufacturing. It is about manufacturing that is benefited by innovation, by the research that takes place here at Harvard, uh, and about the ability to translate that research into commercial application. That's how America can lead. 
go back to the notion that we do invent things that, that change the world in our country. That's where we got to focus. Thank you. Up here. Yeah, you put it down. <laughs> Okay, it's working. Uh, hi, Mr. Cantor. My name is Claire Duncan, and I'm a freshman here at the college. My question is about the sort of, uh, I guess you could call it a divide between fiscal and maybe loosely termed social issues like abortion, gun control, gay marriage, whatever you want to call it. Uh, in this current economic climate, do you consider it more important to focus on fiscal and budgetary issues, even if it means maybe sacrificing some positions on some of the more social issues with Democrats in the House? Or do you believe that the two can be reconciled and dealt with at the same time without uh, having to sacrifice whatever your stances may be on fiscal policy? I don't see the two as mutually exclusive. Um, and I do think we can work together to find commonality in both realms. Uh, and um, I think that most Americans right now uh, would find themselves sort of in the same lot, if you will, in both, in both arenas. Uh, but, you know, it, it is, um, you know, the Republican Party um, has always uh, been criticized uh, for not focusing on one issue or another. Uh, and as a, the majority leader, it's my hope that our party uh, can st always stand on principle uh, and, you know, also uh, look to how we bring people together. You know, it's a common experience of America uh, that, that really has made us the leader of the world. And so, again, these are not mutually exclusive issues. You can just set one aside. Many people are very passionate about both. This is political discourse. This is about leadership in this country. And I do think we can do both at once. Hi, Mr. Cantor. Uh, my name is Charles. I'm a senior at the college. Uh, I was going to ask about something else, but I just had to follow up with um, the, the answer you gave to the global health protesters who were here earlier. It seems like there, there has, there's got to be some kind of difference between cutting programs, cutting pet programs to make the government more efficient, and then cutting programs where people's lives actually depend on it. We talk so much about the right to life here at home. How can we go abroad and, and, and you know, project national security and, you know, build America's future when we're cutting programs that will literally lead to hundreds of thousands of people dying? Yeah, I, I'd respond by saying this. It, it, is, it is about reaching a sustainable model. Again, our wealth can create health everywhere in the world. And it's shown over and again, prosperity leads uh, to the ability for us to lead to lead on health issues, uh, to lead on any number of issues. And right now, the situation goes back to the fact that we are on a fiscal train wreck ride here. We really are. But you yourself said that to really fix the fiscal problem, we got to reform entitlements. But, you know, Absolutely. the cuts to global health are tiny, really, like in the big <laughs> picture of things, right? You know, listen, you people say that the cuts that the House passed last week are a drop in the bucket. They were $100 billion off of the president's FY11 request. But I will say to those that are critical of the fact that it's not big enough, our annual deficit's $1.5 or around there trillion dollars. You're not even at 10%. You're not even at 10% uh, for uh, addressing just this year's annual deficit alone. Again, think about it. People are looking at America and actually questioning whether we're going to be able to pay our bills. That's the situation we're in. Now, it's not as if we haven't dealt with problems before in America. We can deal with this. But again, everyone's going to have to get sort of in the, in, in the, in the, in the vein of trying to solve problems. Long term, the folks who are suffering from AIDS around this world need America, without a doubt. They need America to be healthy. Long term, the people who are struggling on the streets of, of Egypt and Tunisia and Libya and the rest, they need America because America stands for freedom. America says, you know what? We're better off when there are institutions of democracy that flourish around the world that guarantee human rights and human progress. But if America is not healthy, if America cannot sustain the ability to project its influence and power, we're not going to have that result. I'm Majority Leader Cantor. My name is Daniel Rotman. I'm a Master of Public Administration 
candidate here at the Kennedy School. And full disclosure, I'm a Democrat, but first and foremost, I am a Kennedy School student. And I just want to say that within these walls, um, I can speak safely on behalf of many Kennedy School students to say that we strongly encourage all ideologies and all candidates to come and, and all speakers to come here. And I just want to know that I do agree with you. There is, this is what America is about, but there's also a time and a place. And I know that this is online and being viewed. And I want future speakers to know that they can come to the Kennedy School and within these walls, this is a safe place. And on behalf of the Kennedy School students that are here, I thank you for coming here. And I appreciate you being here. My, um, my question to you, uh, so recently, DOMA, and the previous Congress repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And there's been a lot of momentum on behalf of the rights and furthering the equalities for gay and lesbian Americans. My question to you as the majority leader is where, where do we stand now, do you feel, uh, in terms of trying to protect and further the rights, if you believe so, on behalf of gays and lesbians in America? And do you stand by kind of this kind of upward momentum and trajectory that is bringing forth to light, bringing up equality for gay and lesbian Americans? I know it's a, it's a tough question that way, but. No, well, it's a very tough question uh, and could, uh, I know, fill up two hours of discussion and then some. Uh, <coughs> I, I stand on, on the fact that, you know, it's, um, if you're talking about marriage, I mean, if you look at my record, I've, I've, I've always been for traditional marriage. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think anyone, uh, or I certainly wouldn't support bigotry towards anyone. Uh, and again, if we can find some common ground on this issue, uh, you know, I'm certainly uh, all ears and wanting to do so because it goes back to the notion that, you know, if, if, if we can find a way to work together, I mean, there are going to be areas we disagree. There just are. But, you know, that's America, too. You know, it's just like this room. You know, Maybe we're majority in agreement on issues in here, and maybe there, maybe we're not. But I guarantee you, there's a certain amount of percentage we are. So on the issue of uh, of gay rights um, and uh, others, I think there's a really a lot more work that needs to be done uh, to to foster an understanding. But on some of the hot button issues, if you will, I think my record is fairly straightforward uh, on that. Uh, but I appreciate the question. Okay. Thank you. Gentleman up there. Hey, I'm Daniel. I study astrophysics at the college. So, um, as you know, a domestic discretionary spending is something like 15% of the overall federal spending. And you know, I realize entitlement reform is a bit of a third rail, but as upset as people here have been getting over cutting back to 2008 levels, we could cut that back to 1900 levels, the domestic spending, and we still get wiped out by entitlement. So, my question is what specifically are the Republicans going to do about entitlement reform, and when are they going to do it? Right. And uh, good question. Just to your point, remember, you could wipe out all discretionary spending and not even deal with the annual deficit uh, that you've got right now. Um, we said last week, when the president failed to include mention of entitlement reform in his budget, <clears throat> that we were, gonna, we were going to include entitlement reform proposals in our budget. Uh, our budget will come out probably towards the end of March, early April, and will include in it uh, prescriptions as to how to address and reform the programs. Uh, I don't think it, it'd be fair to say that uh, our proposals will not impact today's seniors or those nearing retirement. And I've consistently used the numbers 55 and over. Uh, but for the rest of us, we're going to have to come, with the grip, come to grips with the fact that those programs are going to have to change if we're going to save them uh, for the rest of us. Uh, and so I think you're going to see those um, proposals in detail uh, in about a month, uh, six weeks' time. So, thanks for the question. Up here. You can raise it back up if you want. Hi, uh, I'm Jesse Lava. I'm an MPP student here at the Kennedy School. And um, you've been talking today about tough choices that need to be made. Um, so I want to ask why uh, your tough choice uh, is to choose tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires over programs including Pell Grants. K through 12 education, AmeriCorps, healthcare reform, global AIDS programs, Planned Parenthood, WIC, community health centers, and on and on and on. Why are those so much less important to you? I, 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 
as you could guess, I'm going to just disagree with the assumption of your question. Uh, you know, I, I, I just don't frame it that way. Uh, again, you know, that money, the tax dollars, come from people who earn it. And I know it's very much in vogue to go and castigate those who've been successful uh, and put them in a place where um, they sh feel that, you know, the government needs to take from them to go and address every other problem. Uh, and certainly there is a valid debate that we can have about how much, how much of your income should you pay in taxes to the government. That's a valid debate to have, and we should be having that kind of debate because it then leads to the question of how big should government do? I mean, how big should government be, and what should it be doing? And what percentage of GDP should government be? Those are the kinds of debates we should be having. Instead of saying, hey, you want to lower taxes, which means you're not for these laudable programs over here. No, the choice, the choice really is the choice really is, how do, you, how do you provide for the ability to expand the pie? How, how do you make it so that more people can have opportunity to succeed? Because if more people succeed, and we agree at a certain rate there it needs to be a level of taxation, there'd be more revenues to do the kinds of things that, that you feel government should want to do. But again, we should be having these kind of discussions. And that's what I mean when we're about reform in Washington, that the new Republican majority is very committed uh, to returning to some sense of fiscal discipline, first of all. Because like every family and business in America knows, you got to tighten the belt right now. you got to figure out how you're going to do a little bit more with a little less. So we're starting there. But we're also going to say, look, you know, how do we reposition our country so that you can breed more prosperity and success. We don't want to go in and, and punish people who are successful by saying to them, that's bad, those are billionaires, they don't deserve it. Okay, we, we, we need to say, look, <clears throat> how do we best take care of the issues that the programs you list take care of? First of all, let's ask the question, are all those programs defensible in terms of their efficiencies? Are they accomplishing the mission that we asked uh, them to accomplish in a way that provides taxpayers the adequate return on investment? Or is there ways to be uh, wrought out in those? Can we do it better? Can we do it easier? Can we do it with less? That's the debate right now. <laughs> we've got time for, uh, we've got time for, we've got time for two more questions. So I thank everybody who's, who's still standing in line and wanted to ask a question, but you might as well go back to your seats because we're only got time for two more. Uh, this gentleman here, this gentleman here, and, you're, and that'll be it, so. Hi, my name is Chase Foster. I'm a first year MPP student here at the Kennedy School. And tonight you've discussed the importance of having a, a robust and dynamic economy. Um, and I think you would agree that the economy is still in a pretty perilous place after the, the last crash. We still have 10% unemployment. Um, yet this week, a number of economists from across the political spectrum issued reports and statements that expressed their concern about the effect that your proposed $61 billion of domestic spending would have on the economic recovery. So I guess my question to you is, um, do you think the economy is growing too quickly right now? Are you trying to purposely slow it down? Or, or are you... Um, or I don't know, I mean, it could be that. Or, or are you so committed to a radical free market fundamentalist ideology that opposes all government spending in pretty much every form that might produce a meaningful investment in human beings' lives that you don't really care about the way the cuts are going to sabotage the economy and you want to proceed ahead anyway in order to accomplish your ideological purpose? You know, I want to... I want, to, I, want to, I want to congratulate you on a very creative design for a question. Um, <laughs> and and I, I would just say this. Uh, for, you know, we, we've got a problem here, and, and we, we have a situation where our economy is ailing. Uh, we don't have to go through the numbers. We've talked about them some tonight. Uh, and too many people across this country are out of a job. 
And we've seen the route that of, of government expenditure increasing. We've seen that happen the last two years. And we've seen it happen before that. Because really, uh, there's no party, neither party is, uh, it lacks blame here. Uh, but we saw the largest attempt at stimulus ever in the history of this country when we passed a nearly trillion dollar stimulus bill. Uh, and the promise made was we were going to see unemployment drop to below or never go above 8%. And we all know where it is now. It's hovering around 10% officially. So I would say to you, spending more government money hasn't addressed the most critical challenge facing families in America, which is employment. Because again, you put people back to work, good things can happen. And we can regain the prosperity and the wealth to try and efficiently and effectively deal with some of the things that you're talking about. And that's just where we have to be. That's, that is being responsible. That is caring about consequences. I mean, do you know each and every one of you are going to be so up to, up to here in debt because of what the federal government has done? Who's paying for it all? Who's paying for the nearly 40 cents of every dollar we're spending that's borrowed? How are you going to pay it back? That's the kind of thinking that we all need to start engaging in if we're going to continue to do the kinds of things that you're talking about. Sorry, sorry. You asked a really long question. So, I, um, Harleen's got the last question. Uh, hi, Majority Leader Cantor. Thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, my <coughs> name is Harleen Gambier. I'm a student at the college. And uh, I understand what you spoke about earlier with uh, the reasoning for cutting government programs, and I respect that. What I wanted to ask was specifically with the Pence Amendment, whether you believed that on the part of you and your colleagues, whether that was purely an economic issue or if involved with that was also some ideology that aimed to limit a citizen's right to choose, especially those most vulnerable citizens that need the services of Planned Parenthood. You know, what I felt very strongly is that Planned Parenthood, as, as you know, it was revealed that Planned Parenthood was engaging in some very ugly tactics and some very bad things. And for us to be allowing taxpayer dollars to support that kind of activity is unacceptable. Uh, and uh, I happened, one, uh, one of the, one of the uh, videos that was uh, widely distributed was, um, you know, indicated some activity of that in my hometown. Uh, and again, that is not where most Americans feel their taxpayer dollars ought to be spent, I don't either. Thank you. That brings a close to tonight's forum. I want to thank Leader Cantor and thank the audience for their, their great questions, their civil discourse. This is what America is all about. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.